I want to go to audience questions, and I hope you all have sent some to the iconic tour hashtag. I'll go to those in just a sec. But but from politics back to to entrepreneurialism and entrepreneurship, you've built businesses, you've faced business challenges, you have talked to people like the people in this room, entrepreneurs. What do they ask you most, and what do you tell them? Time. Time seems to be the largest issue. How many of you have time issues in running your business, having to have a life and your time? Can I see your hands out there who feels like that's there? So you can see it's about 90 there you go. Yeah. But the issue of time is not the real issue. The real issue is that they're operating as an operator, not an owner. Yeah. And so what I start to do in the beginning, you have to do both, right? But what I start to do is show them how you have to be able to break off and get other people to do things. But more importantly, I teach people, I do a, you know, a five day boot camp. You know, I call business mastery a couple times a year. And we bring in businesses from all over the world, literally. And we have people just starting a business and we have people with, you know, businesses that are doing a billion, two billion, three. And what you find is that there's a common pattern amongst all these group of people where they, they find themselves if they're if it's a small business, they do everything because they feel like they're the only one who can do it, or they tried someone else and they failed. Well, that happens in every business. You have to begin to leverage yourself, or you're just going to be self-employed, and you'll never have the scalability. A business is a system that adds value even when you're not there, and you as a leader have to get good enough to both hire people and train people so that you're not a manager. A manager works with people to make sure they get the job done while you're there. But if you have to be there, there's, I run 33 companies, I mean, every four days I'm on a plane, train, helicopter on stage somewhere on average in a year, and I got 33 companies. There's 12 I manage directly, but I couldn't do that by management. I do it by leadership. I build leaders who can make their own decisions. I hire people that are the best of the best. Now, in the beginning, that's hard because you have no money. Right? So you hire the best, it's called you, and you pay them nothing. Right? <laughs> and then now you try to hire other people, and what do you do? You hire your friends, which, you know, is a disaster because they're not as skilled, and you love them, and it's hard to manage them. And then I hired people that were really talented, but they were mean, you know? They didn't share my values. And so eventually you get to that place where you can find the right people. But I think the most important secret for the growth of any business, the question I guess on how to get over the time, and the answer is you got to take two hours, 90 minutes a week with your team of one, two, three, 2,000, and you got to meet where you work on the business. And I teach people a format called 7-7, where there's seven areas of a business that you cannot miss. Marketing, sales, optimization, the financials, culture. And I'll make sure that each week you and your team focus on that. Not the day-to-day -day business, but how do we strengthen our marketing, not just for this run, but overall how we build the brand. What do we do to change our sales process? How do we optimize the business? How do we spend no money and grow the business 30% in the next three to six months? And when you take small markers in the business that are critical and you improve them 5, 10, 15%, but you do 12 of them, you'll grow your business 120, 130%, 140% because there's a compounding impact. You don't just get the improvement you've made. So I try to help businesses to make those changes so that so you have time to think and be strategic. Because if you're just running, how many of you are stressed? I'll be honest. I'll be honest if you would. Today, being here and not being at your business, how many feel some stress in your business being away even for a day? Okay, right now, I'm a business operator. F that. <laughs> right. I'm going to become a business owner. You've got to be. Well, I'll give you a very simple process. I was teaching this to someone in Japan yesterday. Uh, actually, a very large number of people in Japan yesterday. And it, very, it starts with a piece of paper and you. A piece of paper and, and a pen or paper pen, 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 will make you rich. And we won't go into goal setting, it's a whole separate process, but make a list of everything that you have to do tomorrow. The best time to make your list is the night before. If you make a list of your whole day for tomorrow, your subconscious will work on your list overnight and you'll wake up in the morning with ideas and insights that are sometimes quite amazing. So you make a list and then you look at the list and you ask this simple question. If I could only do one thing on this list before I was called out of town for a month, which one task would I want to be sure to get completed? And put a circle around that, your list. Now, when you get up in the morning, whatever time you start, and that's a very interesting point, wealthy people start, at, get up in the morning by 6 a.m. 
Poor people get up at seven or afterwards. Wealthy people get up earlier, poor people get up later. Real simple. So if you're getting up around seven o'clock, you're always going to be poor. For the simple reason, by the time you get started, the day is half finished and now you're checking your email and you're talking to your friends and then it's lunchtime and coffee time and, and uh, spam time and everything else. Get up at six o'clock and develop a ritual. Get up, exercise, then sit, plan your day, get organized and start to hit it at eight o'clock. And the first thing you do is you start on your most important task. And then you concentrate single-mindedly on that task. You do not turn on your email. You do not turn on your telephone. You don't do anything except that one task. And you just do this one task until it's completed. Now you've already agreed with yourself and the world that there's nothing more valuable in the world than you could do than this one task. So, so do this. And if you develop a habit of getting up in the morning and starting and completing your most important task, it will transform your life. It's one of the most incredible productivity habits ever discovered. And every person who discovers it, they see their income, their productivity, their performance, and their satisfaction just explode. It's very simple. The question is, do you have the discipline? Do you have the self-control, the willpower to start and complete your most important task? If you, if you don't have it, you can develop it with practice. If you develop with practice, it soon becomes easy and automatic. And if you just do this, your productivity will double the first day. Well, most successful entrepreneurs have gone bust. Right? Yeah. You know, Henry Ford, an old time entrepreneur, he went bust five times. You know, look at Steve Jobs. Yeah. His own board fired him. Yeah. You know, Bill Gates was taken before the Supreme Court for monopolistic practices. Right. Even my friend Donald Trump went down a billion dollars. Yeah. I only went down a million. So the average person is so afraid of those losses, <clears throat> they never get ahead. Because at school they teach you if you make a mistake, or if you fail, you're a failure. But that's not real life. A baby learns to walk by standing up and falling down, standing up and falling down. And our school system punishes you for making mistakes. That's why my poor dad, an academic, mm -hmm. was so unsuccessful. He was terrified of making mistakes. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. Um, but life, th that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it, you can influence it, you can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, the, this uh, erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just going to live in it, versus embrace it, change it, improve it make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. Imagine that you're looking for a stable partner, right? So you might think, well, what do you want in a stable partner? And at least in principle, one of the things you don't want is too much mismatch between you and that person on the five fundamental dimensions. So for example, if you're really extroverted and you have a really introverted partner, you're going to engage in continual conflict about how much social activity the two of you should 
subject yourself to. And it's very, very difficult for people who broadly differ, widely differ on those dimensions to come to consensus because it's not just a matter of opinion, right? It's really a matter of different, if you're looking at extremes, of really different types of people. And the thing about introverts is they just don't enjoy large-scale social interaction that much. One-on-one, -on -one, they're often fine, but in a group, they don't like that, and they, it tires them out. Whereas a real extrovert, it's like you isolate them and, and they just wither on the vine because a huge part of what actually motivates them in a positive way is tangled up with social interaction. And so, if you're an agreeable person and you have a particularly disagreeable partner, you're also going to run into problems because the agreeable person will say, whatever you want, whenever, and the agreeable per or disagreeable person will say, well, I'd like to know what the hell you want for a change and be much more harsh and much more demanding in the situation. And the ag agreeable person is gonna find the disagreeable person harsh and unpleasant. And the disagreeable person is gonna find the agreeable person wishy-washy and unable to stand up for themselves. And again, that's, a, that's actually one of the primary sources of tension between men and women, because women tend to be higher in agreeableness than men. It's about half a standard deviation, which is quite, quite, a, quite, a, uh, quite a large difference by psychological standards. So th there's the problem with agreeableness. With conscientiousness, well, if you're conscientious, you're industrious and orderly. And orderly people seem to be sensitive to disgust, which is something we'll talk about in detail later. But our latest uh, idea is that, my, it's not my idea, it's actually the idea of my graduate student, Christine Brophy, um, is that industrious people find it um, unpleasant and unsettling to, to not be doing something. So it isn't so much that industriousness makes them happy or fills them with positive emotion. That would be more extroversion, right? Because extroversion is the positive emotion dimension. It's that industrious people can't stand sitting around doing nothing. And you know, it, this is speculation, but you know, human beings are obviously always engaged in the exchange of labor, especially the reciprocal exchange of labor. And you can imagine that um, in, a, in a community where everyone knows everyone, the people who work hard are going to be pretty irritated on a fairly chronic basis with the p people who are completely unproductive. And my suspicions are that plenty of people who were completely unproductive in the history of, of, our, of the evolution of our species were wiped out by people who were unhappy with their lack of productivity. And so I think, generally speaking, human beings have this sense of ethical obligation with regards to one another to share labor. And people who are conscientious really, really feel that. So they feel bad if they're not busily working on something that's productive all the time. And so the advantage to being with someone conscientious is, well, they're going to work like mad. But the disadvantage is they're, they're going to work like mad. So, you know, if you're looking for a partner that you want to relax with or have fun with or, or who isn't uptight, then a conscientious person is probably not a very good choice. On the other hand, if you're a conscientious person and you're living with someone who's really unconscientious, that's good because they might be able to help you relax, but you're not gonna be happy with them because they don't work nearly as hard as you do. But even worse, on the orderly dimension, you know, some of you have had roommates and maybe you're more orderly than your roommate. What does it mean? It means you're annoyed by mess before they are. And you don't have to be annoyed by mess much before your less orderly roommate for you to be the one that's always running around picking things up. And so actually, one of the things that's emerged from the psychometric analysis is that women are slightly more orderly than men. And I suspect that has something to do with the, un, what would you call it, inequitable distribution of housework. Because even if you're, imagine that your proclivity is to be triggered by disorder 25 seconds before your partners. Well, you're gonna end up, it doesn't take much difference for you to be the one that's always concerned about the mess first. So anyways, and so if you're a really orderly person and you live with a disorderly person, well, good luck getting along with them. They're going to regard you as like uptight and, and uh, uh, over concerned with details and, and, uh, and well, and unwilling to relax, that's for sure. And they're going to regard you as, well, just a bloody mess. And how can anyone possibly live with someone like you? So another reason why it's useful to understand your personality is because I think it gives you a better crack at finding someone that you can actually live with over the long run. And we don't know what the optimal, I don't think you want to live with someone who's exactly like you because then both of you have the same strengths and weaknesses. And there's a bit of a problem there, right? Because maybe 
an agreeable person can use a bit of disagreeable person around them to balance each other out and vice versa, right? So we don't understand the optimal balance for, for, for long-term thriving in a relationship, but I think we do understand the fact that if you're too different in your traits, that those, that where you're different is going to constitute a chronic source of conflict. The next most important thing is trust, man. It's like there, there's no marriage that's successful without trust. You guys, you've got to tell each other the truth. And one of the reasons that Jung believed that marriage as a and an oath and a Carl Jung as a bond was necessary. It's really wise. It's like, you know, telling the truth to someone is no simple thing because there's a bunch of things about all of us that are terrible and weak and reprehensible and shameful and all of those things. And they kind of have to be brought out into the open and dealt with. And you're not going to tell the truth about yourself to someone who can run away screaming when you reveal who you are. And so the, the marriage bond is something like, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to handcuff myself to you and you're going to handcuff yourself to me. And then we're going to tell each other the truth and neither of us are going to get to run away. And so our, once we know the truth, then we're either going to live together in mutual torment or we're going to try to deal with that truth and straighten ourselves out and straighten ourselves out jointly. And that's going to make us, us more powerful and more resilient and more and deeper and wiser as we progress together through life. And, and I think that's absolutely brilliant because if you leave the back door open, man, you're going to use it, that's for sure. And the oath is there. And this was Jung's commentary on the spiritualization of, of the human pair bond by Christian marriage, for example, which, which emphasized uh, the, the, what would you call it, the subordination of both members of the marital union to a higher order uh, personality that was embodied in the figure of the Logos. So the idea is that in, a, in, a, in the Christian marriage, for example, the man isn't the boss and the woman isn't the boss. The boss is the mutual personality composed by the seeking of truth in both of them. And that's conceptualized as their, their joint subjugation to the Logos. And that is absolutely dead on, man. It's like the ruler of your marital life should be your vow to tell each other the truth. because. Like in hard times during your life when you've done something stupid and idiotic that might take you down and you don't have anybody that you can turn to, you know, if you have a partner that you can trust, you can go say, hey, you know, I made a big financial mistake, man, and it's really torturing me and I feel like a complete idiot and it's really dangerous and the person there is going to help you figure out what to do about it and they're going to know that when they make a stupid mistake and they're bloody well going to, that they can come and talk to you and that you guys are going to work your way through it. And, that's a big deal. And so, um, well, you look for someone that you're attracted to, that you love, and then you look for someone that you can bloody well trust. And then you tell them the truth. And, and that way, maybe you can get through life and you can have someone to weave the rope of your being with and together to make, to make your joint rope stronger. And you can have some continuity in your narrative and you can have children and then you can have grandchildren and like you can have a life, man. And there's nothing. You're so fortunate if you can manage that. Let me give you three ways to find out how to change anything. Any life direction, any dimension. Here's three ways to find out how to change anything. Number one is to read. Become a good reader. All of the successful people I know and work with around the world, they're all good readers. Curiosity drives them to read. They gotta know. They just read, 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 read. Become a good reader. Now that's my opinion. Listen to the other lecturers and listen to me and make up your own mind. Don't be a follower. Be a student. Okay? I say, really, for life change, you gotta read. One way to learn is from your own experiences. But another way to learn is from other people's experiences. See, one book might save you five years if you read it. Did you know there's books on how to be stronger, more decisive? Be a speaker, be a leader, have a better effect on other people, develop your personality. Did you know there's books on that? 
and people don't read them, how would you explain that? And they can read. Did you know that hundreds of successful people have written their stories in books and they wrote down how they did it and people don't read it? How would you explain that? The guy's busy, I guess. You know, you get tied up. The guy says, well, yeah, you work where I work, but the time you struggle home, it's late. You got to eat a bite of supper, watch a little TV, get to bed. You can't sit up half the night reading, 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 reading. And the guy's behind on his car payment. Good worker, hard worker, sincere. But you got to be better than sincere and work hard. Otherwise, at the end of your life, you'll wind up cold, stony broke. You got to be better than a good worker. You got to be a good reader. Get around successful people and listen. Now, you can also learn from unsuccessful people. Take notes on both, negative and positive. On the negative, the notes are called what not to do. And you got to learn what not to do as well as what to do. So learn from the negative as well as the positive. Okay? Find out what poor people read and don't read it. Right? That's good information. Learn from the negative. But now you can also learn from the positive. Get around successful people. Listen to what they say. Listen to how they say it. It's important. We've all got about 16 waking hours. Practice listening those 16 hours. And I say practice listening because listening isn't easy. I found out it's easier to talk than it is to listen. But if you will practice listening the 16 hours you're awake, sure enough from surprising sources comes great ideas. In sales training we teach, if you want to learn sales, listen to the kids. Kids have got to be the master salespeople of all time. They have no equal. Father tells his young son, no, you cannot have an ice cream cone. 30 minutes later, he's licking on one. <laughs> That'd be 30 minutes worth listening to. They got moves you wouldn't believe. Persistence runs deep like the ocean. And the kids never took a class on how to overcome objections. <laughs> They already know how. They don't need classes. You tell kids no. That goes right on by. They give you three good reasons. You say no. It goes right on by. They give you three more. They're masters. So listen and learn. Now here's some of the best advice I've got for the whole evening. It won't get any better than this. This is it. Poor people ought to take rich people out to dinner and listen. That's some of the best I got. <laughs> if a guy's not doing well, one of the first things he ought to do is find a guy that is doing well and offer to buy him his dinner. Spend 50, 60, 80, 100 dollars. Go for the full nine course. Start him on the juices and hors d'oeuvres. Get him started talking. The salad takes 15 minutes. Keep it rolling. Biggest steak in town takes 45. Keep it rolling. Pour on the dessert. Stretch that meal out about two hours. If you get a successful person to eat and talk for two hours, they're liable to drop ideas in your lap, change your life. Multiply your income by two, by three, by five. But you're right. Poor people don't usually take rich people out to dinner. That's the problem. The guy said he's rich, let him buy his own dinner. I'm not coming up with any money. <laughs> and he says, besides, you work where I work, but the time you struggle home, it's late. You're lucky to get your own supper, let alone running around trying to find a rich man to feed. And the guy's behind on his house payment. 
Good worker, hard worker, sincere. But you got to be better than sincere, work hard. You wind up broke. You got to be better than a good worker. You got to be a good listener. And remember what you read and what you hear, put the good stuff in your journal. Now here's the third way to find out how to change your life. And that's to observe. You can pick up a lot of ideas just by watching. Get around successful people and watch. Here's why. Success leaves clues. Watch how the man shakes hands. Watch how the lady responds. People who do well do certain things over and over and over and over. And if you're clever, you can pick them up. Watch it all. If a guy's making $10,000 a month, I'd watch how he walks. Maybe that's it. Copy his funny little walk. Somebody says, well, that's kind of a silly walk. Say, it's 10000 I haven't got the money yet, but I got the walk. It's bound to start somewhere. What I ask you tonight is to be unusual and be a good observer of what's going on. You can pick up ideas that can change your life starting tomorrow. Just be a more careful observer. Now remember, there's two ways to see. One is called sight. See with your eyes. The other one is called insight. See with your mind. See with your eyes, you'll see things. See with your mind, you'll see answers. Put your eyes and your mind to work. And the best advice on developing sight and insight is pay attention. Don't miss anything. In the weekend seminar we teach, one of the greatest fatalities to success is preoccupation, lack of concentration. The guy's mind wanders. See, you wind up average. You've got to learn to zero in and concentrate. I read a good article one time, Reader's Digest. The title was, Wherever You Are, Be There. Excellent. Don't miss anything. Breaking up. Saying goodbye to the person you were once close with and deeply in love with. We've all been there, and we all know how that feels. We've all had our hearts broken. When it happens to you personally, it's devastating. And while people can relate, they aren't in that moment. The pain is there, and it's real for you. Sometimes it feels like you're completely helpless, and you'll never get past the suffering. Sometimes the ones we truly love leave. We're left feeling like we can't live without them. It feels like they took our whole life with them. Your favorite coffee loses flavor. The scenic walk we used to take makes us feel lost. Our beds feel cold, our food tastes bland, and our clothes don't fit and our heads feel disconnected from our body. If I just described how you were feeling, that proves that you are not alone in this situation, even if it was just one of those things that upset you. You don't want someone to be like you, because for once in your life, you're able to feel something, even if it's pain, and you don't want anyone to come into your life to help you or understand you because you just lost that. So even if these thoughts are painful, you're able to feel it. You are processing this breakup as the worst thing that could have ever happened to you. But if you're able to feel it, actually feel who you are, then maybe it was the best thing to happen. Someone leaving your life always sucks in that moment, but down the line, it all starts to make sense. Throw anything away that reminds you of the past. It's not easy to do, but trust me, it will lighten up your load. If you can't let go of keepsakes, it means you're still holding on. And if you know it's pointless to hold on, then be brave enough to burn all the false hopes. 
Memories can never bring back what's gone. So why does this hurt? Breakups hurt so much because you envisioned your entire life with someone else to the point where you've lost who you are without them. This is usually why couples tend to distance themselves because one partner loses who they are and they become dependent on the other and once that weight becomes too heavy, someone has to break. So you might think that you hate this person for breaking your heart, but a lot of times it comes down to the feeling of letting yourself down. So let the fantasy person remember that she or he is not the perfect person that you built in your mind. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in this situation right now. And then move on. Because the fantasies don't exist. The perfect girl or guy for you doesn't exist. So you're going to look out for someone that's good, but you're not going to find perfect. Don't get obsessed with finding perfect. If you find someone that's perfect, that's not true. Everyone's got their flaws. You should know that you need time to heal. Oftentimes, we try to run to the next thing and the next thing and get away from the problem by distracting ourselves with the next thing. And oftentimes, we try to run to the next relationship because we were hurt by the past one. But when we are hurt, we don't give ourselves time to heal, only deepen the wound even more and more. I think of it almost as a cut on your body. When you cut yourself and you keep touching it and allowing it to be exposed to danger, you slow down the healing process. But when you allow time for it to grow and heal, you find that you're better much faster. I think it's the same mentally as well. We'll probably all struggle with something in our mind and at some point in our lives, and we try to distract ourselves with things from the actual problem but that only goes so far. Give yourself time though. Take breaks sometimes. Just sit and be alone for a while. It's a hard thing to understand and it's a hard thing to try to process by yourself because it hurts. Like the feeling when you first get a cut and you put alcohol in it or put something under it to clean it. It burns a little bit, but after a while it leaves you better than you would have been without it. We must understand that everything has its cycle. And if a person has already fulfilled theirs with us, we must respect their decision and move on in life. Because nothing ends because a person is missing. Because we have the ability to be happy of our own account without asking anyone for anything. You just have to have the faith that everything will be fine in the hands of God. Do you find it hard to say no? Are you always trying to second guess what someone else wants you to do? It's time you learned to stop being so eager to please. Can you come to this meeting? No. Yes. Are you free on Saturday night? No, I'm watching Spiral. Yes. Can I borrow your black jacket? No. Yes. Would you like a pizza? No. Yes. Have you got five minutes? No, I don't have five seconds. Yes. Can you pick me up? No. Yes. The yes man or woman scenario. If you're a person who thrives on helping others, you'll likely react to every request with, sure, I can do that. When someone asks for volunteers to help in a meeting, you always raise your hand. Even if no one asks for assistance, but you know they need it, you offer to help. A strong desire to take action isn't bad, but if this attitude means that you're completely overloaded with work and unfocused on your top priorities, you are failing to keep the commitments that truly should fall under your ownership struggle with focus and poor quality of decisions. Research shows that our willpower is like a muscle that can get tired. After exercising self-control and pouring all your energy into pleasing others, your mental resources will be depleted. You will fail in your attempts to do focused work, which will add to your sense of frustration 
and cause you further stress and anxiety. Being a people pleaser, you will consciously make a series of decisions based on others' sense of right and wrong as opposed to standing up to what's right. Instead of making a few decisions and making them very well, every activity will turn into a struggle to align with others' interests and sense of approval, leading to decision fatigue. Eventually, overwork, burnout, and exhaustion will create a feeling of resentment towards the same people you volunteered to help. You might even realize that you are being taken for granted or that others take advantage of you because of your enthusiasm to never turn anyone down. Your anger and resentment towards your own behavior will impact your well-being and also build bridges of misunderstanding with your coworkers. Instead of strengthening bonds, it will break relationships. Learn to say no. People pleasers have trouble saying no. When you always say yes, you can easily become overwhelmed. It will be hard to take pleasure in the things you do if you are doing too much. This can lead to feeling anxious and building resentment against the people you are helping. Saying no some of the time can keep this from happening. You don't need to give a lengthy explanation as to why you are saying no. Keep it short and matter of fact. Start by saying no to small requests. Try not to volunteer your time, energy, and help automatically. If you have two people ask you for something, say yes to only one of the requests. Saying no to some of the things that you really don't want to do enables you to devote your all to the things that are important to you. When you are able to say no, your yeses become more meaningful as well. Know yourself. It is easy for people pleasers to be very aware of the needs and wants of others. However, it can be difficult to know your own wants and needs. In order to know what is important to you and what you want and need, you need to know yourself. Spend time alone with yourself daily and figure out your likes and dislikes. Listen to your inner voice and figure out why you are really doing something for someone else. If it is just so they will like you, or because you don't want them to be upset, maybe you should say no. When you are clear about what you want, you can start saying yes to yourself and meeting your own needs instead of worrying about everyone else. Practice self-care. Once you know yourself and your needs, you can start practicing self-care. Self-care is about giving yourself the things that help you feel refreshed calm, and energized so you can thrive. This includes eating healthy meals, exercising, engaging in activities that you enjoy, and spending time with friends and family. It can also include meditation, mindfulness, practicing gratitude, getting your hair and nails done, and taking a relaxing bath. Self-care is not selfish. In fact, when you take good care of yourself, you have more to give to others. To start focusing on your own needs and stop being a people pleaser, try these tips. If people pleasing is having a negative impact on your emotional well-being, therapy can help. When you stop trying to please everyone else, you will have the time and energy to care for yourself and do the things that bring you joy. To sum it all up, be a people respecter not a people pleaser. Never hesitate to do the right thing. When your frail neighbor asks politely, go ahead and shovel her driveway. When your colleague asks, make a donation to get your longtime coworker a retirement gift. That's just being respectful. But of all the people you respect, be sure to include yourself. Thank you again for watching our videos, and please, don't forget to subscribe to your channel, Motivational Vibes. Feel free to leave feedback below in the comment section. How can we improve our content? What kind of videos would you like to see? Let us know in the comments.